Hello there and welcome back to the Agassino Zynga Show, episode number 615. This is 615 of the Agassino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and I hope you are doing well. Wherever this pod may find you, I hope you are doing bloody well. How am I? Great, all things considered, you know the deal. We just keep chipping away. We're now in, what, day 27 or so of October. That's going pretty decently. I can't complain. Um, like most things that you do, especially when you decide to do them for a prolonged period of time over the, you know, maybe over a month, usually the first couple of days are pretty brutal. Then the maybe under, I don't know, maybe the 13 day mark is a little bit harsh. But once you get over the two week mark, the two week point, I find most things are pretty easy to stick to because you're already halfway through. There's no point of cheating now. There's no point of kind of going back on what you said you were going to do or dabbling in things you said you weren't going to do because you're already halfway over so um, that kind of helped in that regard and I think as well the weather has kind of helped as well weirdly enough because it's kind of chapping and cold here in London there's not really much to do on the outside we're not the best outside city in the world we've got loads of cool places to go on the inside right loads of great free museums free gallery that you can go to and whatnot nice bars and restaurants but in terms of just hanging out on the streets there's not really that great of a vibe in terms of you know doing that kind of thing so it's easy to stay indoors and just kind of knuckle down so I'm happy that's happened and now we're heading over to the home stretch the home stretch is happening this is the last weekend that I'm going to be able to say that I've been completely sober of anything which is going to be cool and yeah I'm looking forward to like I said previously continuing this on long term wise and having alternating months here and there because in general it's not really the activity itself that's mashing me up it's definitely the day after or the couple of days after that are really kind of killing me and basically putting me in a place where I'm basically taking way longer to recover than I would like to which I obviously detest because it takes time away from doing stuff like this and other things I want to do and generally I just don't like feeling useless for like a couple of days just because I wanted to party it's not that serious really it's not that serious I'm talking about um being serious and talking about doing things better going forward I think this interview that I'm going to share here which I was graciously invited to do by Lashland so big up him for reaching out to me um you know it's been interesting I feel like especially during a pandemic I feel like I took this thing a little bit more seriously I was a bit more consistent with my uploads especially when it came to talking about the comedian stuff but again you guys know especially on the podcast side of things I'm not really somebody that likes to talk about that stuff a lot but because the views are what they are I kind of have to feed the streets and give the people what they need but if it was up to me I would much prefer to be doing this full time in terms of talking about this cultural stuff that I like to talk about as opposed to ragging on these LA based comedians because it can get boring after a while there's only so much ragging on Brenda Shaw you can do until you want to bloody blow your brains out but I feel like ever since I've basically just I've been attacking it on both fronts and mostly during the pandemic because locked inside I have nothing to do and then just now because I've working from home so I've got the luxury to kind of switch between two things very quickly I don't have to travel back or anything or go somewhere you know that kind of takes a couple of hours out of your kind of day it makes it easier for me to record in the morning or record in the evenings and I feel like that consistency has basically got me on some people's radar who I probably wouldn't have been on their radar beforehand because I was just doing it here and there and I feel like that consistency ended up getting me this interview which I thought was really cool I haven't read it because I just feel weird and awkward about doing self-promotion in the first place the fact that my face is here and my face is there again on the screen is just bizarre or there not here there it's just strange to me I can't really handle that kind of thing but in this world where you're wanting to um in this world where you're wanting to present yourself as some kind of authority or inform people of the things that you do and let it be known what you do, how you do it. It's probably important to kind of put your stuff out there. And I guess this is one of them. So big up Lashland for doing this interview with me. It's a really good one in terms of giving you an out a kind of a a bit of a summary of kind of what I'm about and what I'm you know what my thoughts and feelings are on certain topics i quickly scan down so you can see some of the headings there on his era of promoting parties on techno tourism on paris on honestly never mind six months later removed on skateboarding on these brilliant asian colleagues in central St. martins on the scene politics and five-year tenure at nike on the podcast and a few other bits as well you can see so if you want to check that out and get an idea on what i'm about and stuff and 
some of the things have kind of informed who I am as a person and whatnot, definitely check out the Slash Science um, Substack. I'm going to put the link in the description so you can check it out yourself. But it's called Agostino, Agostino Zinga Celestial Navigation. Brilliant title, actually. If I say so myself, broadcasting from London to the universe. So definitely check it out and give the guy a follow and subscribe to his um, Substack and whatnot and check out the things that he's going to do in the future because I think he has a definitely bright future in writing these kind of pieces about people especially someone like myself who kind of you know I struggle in terms of communicating things about what I do and what I'm into kind of outside of this little podcast I do which is just kind of essentially just a platform for me to basically speak to things about I'm interested in when it comes to shining the light back on me it can get a bit weird as you can tell from the mushy mouth um, explanation that I'm doing here clearly I'm being a bit nervous about this whole thing but yeah shy nervous a bit embarrassed but still I think it's really really well done and I absolutely love the picture so definitely check it out if you haven't got the opportunity as you can see there got the Irax supreme gloves and the blur there shining through in the streets of Shoreditch and whatnot me you know doing my thing so definitely Definitely check it out if you haven't already. It's really, really nice. Good interview. Great guy. Definitely support it if you can. Please support it if you can. Then I want to move into the show and talk about something that I thought was interesting because it definitely marries up to my actual scene report that I would kind of share and just my real life experiences being outside. So this is taken from the Business Techno Instagram page. And I guess they were at ADE or somebody associate with them was that ADD, ADE, sorry, the industry type thing that happens in Amsterdam. I'm not really too sure what the point of that thing is, actually. I'm not too sure if it's an industry thing just to kind of, you know, for them to all suck each other's dicks and wank each other off, or if it's actually something that's integral to the scene overall. But in general, a lot of kind of industry stuff comes off the back of it, similar to that thing they have in Ibiza, I forgot what it's called. Um, there's another thing in Ibiza too, where people, you know, where old white guys sit on the panel and talk about dance music and pontificate about booking fees and whatnot and do their very best to not be diverse in their bookings oh no actually they talk about diversity and inclusion and sustainability but then they go back to their clubs and do exactly the same thing more Ricardo Villa Lobos please 20 hour sets thank you very much but anyway um, Business Techno shared these two takeaways that they received or they got from ADE which I thought very much married up to my real life experiences number one takeaway was the clubs are struggling in Europe. One of the reasons being if competition from festivals worldwide. I'm definitely somebody who can agree with the fact that clubs are struggling in Europe. As I've been to where I've been to clubs mainly in Berlin, obviously here in London, but that's still kind of Europe in that regard. And I've definitely seen a dip in terms of the people who are outside and at parties. And even just anecdotally, for the people that I, because usually whenever I've gone to Berlin, d these days not so much because I just kind of keep myself to myself. But the times I have gone, I've been able to maybe link up with some friends who I know who work in bars and restaurants and stuff. And then you end up bumping into other people who you then end up adding on Instagram and end up kind of being your social media friends. Or somebody you might just bump into in a club in London who says, yeah, I live in Berlin. If you're ever over there, come and hang out. And usually those things are said under the influence of drugs and alcohol, so it doesn't always work out, but sometimes it does. And for the people that it does, where you kind of feel like there is an actual connection there, I feel like those people were the ones that were flaking the most. Or like one of the last times I was going like, hey, do you want to hang out at the break? Mm, not really. I'm not really in the party mood anymore. I've moved on to other things. I think some people actually said they don't even rave at all anymore. It's not something they're interested in, but if you want to hang out and just go to a market, I'm cool. I was like, whoa, that's pretty interesting to see people who I met who are kind of really about this life, really on the scene, really going to all these parties, putting on events themselves, DJing in other places, you know, and just kind of putting their face around and then suddenly, in a blink of an eye, they've all kind of changed tact and decided to do other things going forward. A lot of it might be tied as well to the, there was a big, if I remember correctly, there was a big issue with like mental health in Berlin. I remember that being a thing during lockdown because you can imagine a city that's essentially built off the back of dance, music and clubbing closing down and people being in lockdown and not being able to go outside and express themselves and dance and take drugs and drink and shit or just you know listen to music it must have been really difficult to kind of handle so a lot of those people maybe decided for the benefit of their mental health overall even if clubs come back they're not going to come back because they want to just look after themselves better and maybe they took that time to reflect and maybe say the reason why they're maybe suffering is maybe because you know the clubs have become way too important and if that's in it you know and if you're at a point maybe where like you know clubs are really legitimately affecting your mental health especially if you can't go it might be there might be an argument in saying that maybe you should just not go in general and try and fix the parts of yourself that need 
those places in the world to be whole. Do you know what I mean? Because it's a bit much. It's like it's like whole. It's like hanging your entire hopes of life on one person and a partner. It can become toxic very quickly. So that might be an issue in that regard. But my general thing that I've kind of hung my hat on and something that I'm definitely going to stand by in terms of my POV, just again from a punter's point of view and somebody who's kind of been out and about a lot, is I think a lot of this has to do with Brexit. And also has to do with kind of, you know, a lot of people basically leaving, especially the United Kingdom or going back to their native countries. So especially, in, in, you know, here in London, we have a big population of people who come from Spain, you know, Italy, France, and a few other places in Europe who kind of basically come here when they're in, you know, maybe late teens, early 20s to basically find themselves maybe, you know, further their career, further their education or just kind of be about in the scene. And usually those people tr trickle into different scenes, especially when it comes to club spaces. They maybe start their own nights. They maybe decide to become an artist themselves, set up labels, whatever it may be. Or they just become really enthusiastic punters. And if you know anything about London, you know, especially in the tech house side of things, the Italians and the French, they love that shit. Right? And they're there in their droves. They get their friends to come over and visit them. They stay in the same house. They go out there and party. And for the most part, that crowd, unlike the kind of all black, sort of like double decker boot crowd that listen to dark techno, that tech house crowd, they spend money. They go to parties and they literally, you know, want to give away their money, whether it's buying pills on a dance floor or buying rounds or just buying food beforehand or afterwards, they definitely spend money. So if you can imagine all those people basically leaving and going back home, to look after family members, um, to maybe, you know, uh, take, put their family affairs in order, or maybe just to go, go, go back closer to their family and friends in general, because, you know, it, it, what's, what's the point of being in lockdown and being on your own here in London with no clubs to go to? You might as well just go back home and do the same thing, but at least with your family and friends near you. And I think the, um, the, the fact that most of the people left and haven't come back has definitely affected the clubs overall in terms of their in terms of how full or not full they are and i can definitely feel it when i go out you can feel it a lot when you go to the smoking area i think i bumped into way more i would say quote unquote british people than i ever done beforehand and the whole techno tourism thing you don't really see it too often so i think a lot of that has basically affected places and like i said previously like i've been lucky enough to go to Berkheim in 2019 or 2020 i think it might have been just before the actual lockdown happened and then i went as soon after it kind of reopened or the lift the kind of bands or lockdowns was kind of lifted and you could definitely tell a big difference even when i went just before the lockdown happened there was definitely already a vibe shift there was definitely less people there um less real kind of let loose hedonism people are a little bit more i'd say hesitant to kind of really enjoy themselves because they weren't really sure what the future was going to hold all those things were kind of up in the air and generally it hasn't really recovered so and then I think the competition with festivals thing worldwide is a bit of a misnomer because for the most part, festivals worldwide have always been where they are and there's probably more festivals than ever. So the choices are flipping, you know, there's unlimited choices and they are a lot of money. So now in this kind of, you know, in this economy we're in at the moment, with a recession going on at the moment, I just can't, I just can't believe that there's an abundance of people who are going to be buying tickets. For instance, I was talking about it before in the other pod, that flipping gas and bread put their prices up right to 330 pounds or something and i was arguing hey primavera is a much better value even if I'm right or wrong, I can't necessarily see a person who would have gone to go to Glastonbury and also go to Primavera in the same year. You're basically spending nearly five grand, you know what I mean, just in terms of going there, you know, split between two places, I'd imagine. So I don't really see that happening in a in a kind of recession. People are going to probably hold on to their money and do things locally or just do what some of my friends do and hire out an Airbnb and just, you know, get absolutely wasted in there for the most part. So I'm not very sure that's necessarily true. And then the second observation that they took from ADE was as follows visuals are becoming more important for music events prompting the question if artists who focus on music can keep attracting enough people and this is something i've noticed also especially in london when it comes to promoters like um, labyrinth who do a lot of stuff with innovision who are obviously doing an event with kind of music and a couple of weeks i think or maybe next week here in london and they they kind of go a, a long way to try to add those kind of elements into their parties. You know, I can complain that the fact that they don't post set list, I can complain maybe the venues aren't the greatest, but in terms of the production of the actual event, they try some things. The, the recent world thing we went to, where we went to see um, Henrik Schwartz and Arm play, they had a, they had like a, 
weird kind of VIP type section thing that they were testing that would I, by all accounts look like it was quite a bit of a success um, they obviously had really cool lights and kind of displays on the wall I'm not sure if there were LEDs or whatnot but everything was kind of I felt like done on purpose with an actual VJ or lighting technician person on, on deck it wasn't just something that was a plug-in thing that linked up to the flipping mixer or the Serato so there was a lot more investment going to things which I'd imagine again would eat into your profits if you're a promoter it's not things that you're doing um with the i with the idea that they're going to add to your profits they're definitely going to take away from it and it's stuff that only certain people will actually acknowledge or even appreciate but overall when it comes to taking pictures and sharing those social media bits and having it be a little bit of a loop in terms of um you putting on those great events having people you know and putting on these great light displays which then encourage more people to take pictures which then encourage those pictures to get shared which then encourage more people to come to your next event so you know even though it costs you money it can maybe end up kind of benefiting in the long run but again, not everyone can do it, especially if you don't have the, you know, the the means to, the space to, maybe the place you're hiring doesn't allow it, whatever it may be. But I have seen a huge uptick in this. And the most recent, recent event I went to was Dixon at Printworks. And that was a full on light display. You know what I mean? That was from the LED panels that kind of line up against the whole kind of corridor that is Printworks. The massive screen thing that floats above the DJs when they're playing. It was a whole entire light show. They had like a whole team in that kind of section behind or right towards the back of print works that are working diligently to keep those lights going and stuff or whatnot so definitely something i've seen people a lot more investing in which makes a lot of sense because it goes back to my first point if there's less people in clubs especially because of brexit or the all the kind of immigrants or foreigners out here um that were kind of you know trying to make a life here and now i've gone back and maybe decided hey maybe my hometown isn't as bad as i thought it was and the clubs are generally empty you're gonna have to make people you have to make them you have to make nice out more value for money and if it, you are appealing to brits or you are appealing to people who are kind of you know homebred and whatnot it's going to be difficult to get them out of their houses so you're going to have to make sure that their 30 pound that they're spending or they're going to have to make sure they want to make sure that their 30 pound they're spending is going to go a longer way than just buying a ticket and basically seeing someone play on a black table with some pioneer decks on it. it's going to have to be more than that so i definitely get that idea going forward but it's interesting just to see that the same things i'm seeing in real time are being echoed by the people in the panel and this is across europe because these guys i would imagine represent or uh you know spokespeople for different you know countries and whatnot different areas around europe and i'm assuming every scene is different but there are some commonalities that sort of run between them so big up business techno for sharing that big up this is Tesh, business techno for sharing it next on the list we've got this topic courtesy of ra regarding um, Richie Horton and his up and coming clothing label, right, for Plastic Man. And for some reason, this has caused a bit of a stir, especially in the comment section where he uploaded this. And the title is Richie Horton and Swish Knitwear Brand Frankenberger Reveal Plastic Man Clothing Line. Prices for the limited edition clothing range from 170 euros to 3,200 euros. And for some reason, people within Techno kind of got really, really pissed off about this, I guess, because, you know, I, for some reason, some fans think you're not allowed to make money or you're not allowed to charge whatever you want for stuff and people would if they want to buy it, they want to buy it. I think people still are in this kind of under this false idea that the scene is somewhat underground. To to be ranting and raving at Richie Horton about underground anything is absolutely ridiculous considering how high level he is, considering his experience in the scene, considering where he's kind of taken his career, to basically be, be bemoaning him and calling him out and saying that he should be more underground is absolutely ridiculous. It's like telling flipping Carl Cox he should be playing in fucking two hundred pound sorry, two hundred cap venues. You know what I mean? This guy's playing in fucking auditoriums and shit. Why would he go to a two hundred cap venue in a basement bar somewhere and pay for and play for fucking free drink tokens it makes no sense but anyway let's let's read the article richie horton has collaborated with zurich based fashion label frankenberger on a limited edition run of plastic man knitwear with prices ranging between 1000 um sorry 170 euros to 3200 euros the collection consists of sweats hats and mittens and double blankets all of which are 100 percent cashmere the products are also sustainably created with inner uh, mongolia according to a statement of the website which Horton's net new event series for our minds also just to kind of make this a point ra knew what they were doing 
they knew what they were doing. That title for this article, the subtitle for the actual story itself, the mentioning of the prices again, they knew what they were doing. They knew this would cause a bit of a stir. They're probably lacking for the clicks as well. So, you know, this new era of journalism is fucking gross. They knew exactly what they're doing. This feels like a fucking dance music version of a of a of a Daily Mail article or something. They kind of you know they they kind of put the bait out there and people bit. Um, it continues. This isn't the first time Hoyer has partnered with the fashion brand in 2021. Plastic Man soundtracked Prada's full 20, sorry, full winter menswear presentation at Milan Fashion Week, which was incredible, by the way. Watch that show if you haven't already. Further examples of his entrepreneurship include co founding music technology, um, fund launching a sake brand, and releasing his own DJ mixer. For our own minds, for the, our minds will take over the Garasha ADE this Friday from October 21st with Horton joined by Fiak Kobolsi, Sama Ab- Abdulu Haidi I, I find it interesting when this happens because this is clearly like a um, Sama Abdul Hadid, right? This is clearly uh, an attempt to kind of curry the the sort of favour and the attention of the young kids, right? Who clearly wouldn't listen to Richie Horton because they just wouldn't, right? Um, they're into probably younger, cooler people. It makes sense. That's not, it's not a slight on him. It just is what it is. But I find it interesting when he kind of lines up with people like this, right? Like Fiak, Kobosi, Sama Abdulid. Like clearly, sorry, Sama Abdul Hadid. Hadi, is it Hadi? Abdul Hadi, yeah, Abdul Hadi. Is that Sama Abdul Hadi? I keep pronouncing the name wrong. But regardless, I find it very um, cringe and almost kind of, I won't say pathetic, but it feels a little bit lame. If you're already in the legend that he is already, you should be established enough to kind of hold your weight on your own. Or better yet, getting people from your generation who can kind of speak to that kind of music, that sensibility, or people that you're just inspired by in general. But I can't imagine Rishi Horton going out and, you know, and flipping, paying a ticket price or going somewhere to go and see Fiak Kabosi or Sama play anywhere. Let's be honest. He's clearly just, you know, booking them alongside him for the clout or the promoters booking him along, booking those people alongside him to kind of, you know, to fill out the venue a little bit and to make it a little bit more worthwhile and to obviously hope that it flipping sells out and whatnot because you're hoping all these people have very big fan bases especially online you're hoping that a few of them are going to come out and see them play and also want to see him play too but i found it a little bit cringe personally for me but let's continue to the actual instagram page because you'll see the comments and the pages are absolutely ra- ravaged but to, i'll try to make a quick point on this right Richard Horton, I feel like, has always been somebody who approached, especially when he kind of became successful. There was always kind of this thing around him, especially in Detroit, that he kind of sold out. And I don't think he ran away from it. I think in general, he's kind of, I feel like he kind of wanted to always evolve and kind of become bigger than just a dance music DJ. That's probably why he doesn't play on traditional turntables anymore, right? He doesn't really play vinyl. He doesn't really play on CDJs. He essentially uses controllers and other bits and bobs to basically get his set and to basically play and to express himself. And I've seen him do it. Um, I was lucky enough to go to a an event that he put together for, I forgot what the name of it was for, but it was for something he was promoting. I think it was like a, a piece of gear or something else he's promoting in fucking forward of all places, which was awesome because um, we got to see, I got to see actually his whole kind of, you know, range of fans, people like myself, chin strokers, really old people who kind of have grown up with him along the years, young people who are just curious and interested about him, especially the Plastic Man era. All that stuff was pretty cool to see, in, you know, and obviously to see Richie Horton play in a venue like Fold, that's, you know, maximum, what, 700 people, 500 people, and to be that close to him up, you know, at the front and stuff and seeing him do his magic, because usually he's playing at flipping crazy big places, was quite cool, I'm not going to lie. And he actually smashed it, to be honest, as well, because I've always got this theory that the bigger the person they actually the more comfortable they're going to be in really small places because the bigger places they probably take their foot off the pedal they kind of go through the motions because everyone there is you know probably there to hear fucking one or two songs of yours that are really popular but when you play these really tight small spaces usually you're with people who kind of give a shit about what they're listening to and what they're going to experience and they're clearly coming there to kind of vibe out and rock out and enjoy your fucking journey so that usually works in that regard but going back to him anyway he's always been very entrepreneurial he was also the kind of person who was trying to fucking shift sake in a nightclub if you've ever been to a restaurant and you've had you know japanese fucking food or whatever you know or any kind of asian cuisine you will know how expensive sake is it's not cheap even if you buy it by the bottle even buy it by the glass in some places it's not the cheapest thing to buy so the fact that he was going to clubs and trying to shift his sake clearly shows you 
that he was on a whole nother tip because you'd imagine a lot of people who are going out there are going out there, you know, with fucking 20 quid in their pocket to spend on drinks and maybe a couple of grams of ket in their back pocket, but that's it. They're not going out there to spend like 200 pound or whatever on sake. But the fact that he tried to do it, I feel like tells you everything about his motivations and what kind of vibe he's on because you're trying to maybe elevate things in his own way, offer something different and interesting. Maybe it worked, maybe it didn't work, but that should, I just think that should, shouldn't, that should tell you where he's kind of going direction wise and it shouldn't be a surprise when he puts out product like this and tries to sell it for you know 150 euros to 3000 euros this shouldn't be a surprise and also it's a collaboration with a fashion brand if he also do this with louis vuitton while virgil was still alive that would that would obviously be the same sort of thing in terms of a vibe it would look exactly the same taking these pictures like this with a blanket at the rave is a bit cringe i'm not going to lie but still i think it looks pretty cool it's not for me of course you know i'm never gonna be wearing fucking fingerless gloves like i'm you know like i'm a dj fucking mma fighter or something behind the deck i think that's pretty pretty lame but i understand that some people might like it and if they want to buy it they can if they want to look like him fair enough but there's nothing about this in my opinion that's appealing nothing at all the logo is just printed on some cashmere stuff on items it basically looks like regular merch outside of the blanket right it's not really that special maybe that's the interesting part of it but a lot of the criticism like i said in the comments is more so this idea that he's flipping underground which is not, he's not underground in the slightest. This guy's as commercial as they come, but some people are expecting him to be selling t-shirts on flipping, you know, um, through the loom blanks for like 20 quid or something. That's not going to happen. But the comments, just read through him. One person says, yeah, the blanket is 3,200 euros. I can book plenty of DJs for that amount or make a nice donation to a non-profit or discount business to class tickets. Again, I don't think that's to do with anything he's selling, to be honest. A, a good point, but it's not anything to be selling. Um, obviously, some people are liking it. Ellen Allian says they love this. Um, Klein Klonk says they're legendary. Hector Oak says, wow. I don't know if that's a wow for the price or wow because they like it. DJ Anna says, heart eye emoji. Another person says, when techno is rich, um, it's, when techno is for the rich, it is lost. Capitalism engulfs everything. Richie Horton can't help himself. But what are you talking about can't help himself? Are, are people basically saying that because he gets a higher mind in terms of his DJ fees, that means he can't charge anything more when it comes to him selling anything outside of that. That's insane. So that basically means he's only allowed to make money one way, basically playing behind the playing playing behind the DJ deck. But if you try to do anything outside of it and you price it in a way that you want to position yourself next to some of the higher luxury brands, suddenly you get called out. For me personally, I just don't think it looks that impressive. It just looks a bit shit. Like I said, it's just this logo on like some nice cashmere tops and whatnot. So it's not something I'd be super eager to run and buy. And also if I'm spending 300 euros on an item, I'm not exactly going to be wearing it to a rave in it. Unless it's plenty, I'll go for it on something. I mean, but this doesn't really make any sense. I'd rather just buy that than buy this sort of thing. And that person says, glad I hung my $20 Plastic Man shirt from 2000 on, or to hang on to, sorry. And that person says, I'll stick with my $25 slip mats. Luxury Techno is in my cup of tea. So if people... Again, I don't get his points. But if people here have $20 merch or $25 merch from Plastic Man, if that's the case, why are you bothered about this merch that's a couple of grand? Clearly, he can make both things. He can collaborate with a fashion brand and make high-end stuff, quote-unquote. But then he can also make basic shit for fans who just want to support um, you know, and kind of put some money in his pocket, whatever. That's pretty cool as well person what the fuck 720 person says why well, i do this first the gucci collab then the nft nonsense now obscenely juice pressed it. um jumpers this isn't techno this is edm style greedy bullshit you're losing the room you know what the point here i think is the best is the nft thing richie Horton is still shilling nfts despite everything that we know about nfts the fact that they've essentially fallen out of favor most nfts are lost a considerable amount of their value but this guy is still shilling nfts and still on this kind of wave of trying to get them integrated with dance music and you know the fucking blockchain all this sort of nonsense that should be something that people should be you know maybe going at him more but i don't get the idea of making an expensive clothes with an expensive fashion label and selling it and then people get upset about it um it, it just kind of it means that if he did a collaboration with prado or gucci people would see it as what as him basically spitting on the scene and not honoring his underground roots the man is not underground look at that haircut that, ha that haircut is not of a man who's underground in the slightest when's the last time we went to underground rev and you saw a guy with a hairline like his with that kind of haircut it doesn't exist this is somebody who's clearly 
you know, of a certain standard, has a entire team around him, has somebody that probably organizes his calendar, somebody that gets his fucking matcha in the morning and shit, and all that kind of stuff. Someone maybe that maybe massages the flipping soles of his feet. Like those things are what he does on a you know on a regular basis. And it makes sense because he's probably booked and busy, you know, a lot every every other weekend. Um but another person says here a mug it is then <laughs> i fully understand the price well done cashmere is expensive that said it's maybe a bit tone deaf to launch it right now given um the, the overall squeeze anyway it's lovely products i hope it sells which is again maybe something there's something in it but when is the right time to sell stuff during a global recession do you wait until the recession is over when is it going to be over do you wait in the middle of it like when when is it because it's not like people are not spending money it's just that there's not a lot of money out there that people are spending or whatever it may be but they're still standing they're still spending it um another one says here to end and we'll move on it says um the, this collection is not for real fans it's for rich people who celebrate you because others say you're the best but they don't feel the music <laughs> this this gatekeeping of fucking artists and fandom is absolutely cringe and lame um they say you're not uh, real fans you pose on instagram you can afford the ibifa but you will never be a real raver a real raver doesn't stand still he dances he doesn't have his mobile phone in him and he doesn't drink champagne and above all doesn't wear 720 euro jumper privately sorry yo you are talking absolute shit real raver does this real raver does that what are we doing now this is this is typical chin stroker behavior are we now policing how people rave how they enjoy themselves what they drink what they wear this is nonsense especially now where clubs are suffering more than ever there's not amount of people out there on the dance floor you're now telling people how to go about and do things but to be honest um i'm probably speaking out my ass because i think all this backlash has worked because if you actually click the link that takes you to the store look what happens there 404 page not found so either it's limited edition and it's all sold out which i don't believe or i can't imagine that happening or they've taken the site down because of the backlash which is pretty gnarly you do a whole collaboration with a company you maybe have to split the production cost and whatnot you have to go through the stress of you know making it producing it shipping it all that stuff and then you finally get to putting it out people lambast you in the comments right the comments keep going if you just scroll there there's more and more and more bad comments going there people are not really kind of leaving their thoughts and opinions on there to the point where you feel like you have to take the product down that i think is stupid in my opinion if you made it you made it put it out there put your name on it stamp it and just let it be what it is but all this kind of walking stuff back I'm not for in the slightest in that regard because I think most people just need to grow up and accept that some of these guys especially someone like a Richie Horton like this dude is probably what is what is his net worth actually because some people are being a little bit silly with this stuff like what is this man's net worth so this is what Google are saying right we don't know in, in general let's see wealthy gorillas this is a random website that's updated on October the 22nd. It says roughly this man's net worth from DJing, right? Playing other people's music or his music and having that awful haircut. Like we're saying he might be worth $11 million. What do you expect someone that makes $11 million or who's worth that to be doing? You expect them to be selling, you know, through the loom t-shirts every single day. It doesn't make any sense. And if you want that kind of thing, you can support people like this. Can't decide. You can support people like this kind of music. They make decent enough priced um, items that you can back and support, um, especially if you're into that kind of music that they do or you're into the DJs themselves. There's plenty of options out there that exist, but people, again, you know, or you make the effort to go out and buy these things because they're not, you know, maybe the coolest thing in the world or they're not directly in front of your face or they're not promoted or pushed by super, super, you know, level star flipping DJs. You probably won't. So all this complaining about it is a bit nonsense of you in my life because, you know, there's always these options here that exist, you know, for how much these tees, like $20, $30, 30, 30 euro t-shirts exist. And obviously 700 and fucking 50, 20, whatever, um, you know, cashmere jumpers also is just some plastic, man. So it's up to you, innit? You've got to choose your poison, but I don't think it's a bad thing if people want to go out there and make some extra wonga and use their celebrity to do so. Me personally, I don't think it's a bad thing. I don't think it's a bad thing at all. But hey, what do I know, innit? What do I know? Moving on, we have this news courtesy of RA again. It says here, courtesy of RA, 
New South London club called Loki opens up next week. The team said the Brixton space will prioritise extended sets, back-to-backs and not ridiculously expensive ticket prices. I wonder if this is a response or reaction to what's happening globally with the lack of people actually going out with the fact that a lot of people who are European based maybe can't come over to London, especially some of the bigger acts. Maybe a lot of them have also kind of pivoted away from traveling because I've heard that also through, through the grapevine that a lot of big acts are basically refusing to travel outside of their, you know, whatever region, whether it's Europe or whatever it may be, um, because of how expensive it is to get around and because of how long they are going to be spending away from family and whatnot. And because generally the pandemic and COVID or the lockdown specifically has changed people's priorities. People are now at the point where they realize, hey, I can actually survive pretty decently and live a really decent life if I play maybe three weekends out of the month. I don't need to be away all the time, but it does help if I'm able to come back every Sunday and shit, right? And put my my kids into bed before they go to school on Monday. And, you know, that would obviously take out going to places like London, which might take a bit longer to get back home. So that might be a response to this, this club opening up and having this kind of, you know, approach to booking and whatnot but even if that's not the case I do think this is quite interesting having a space that prioritizes extended sets which I've said before is something that I wish would be um, pushed a lot more in London but because of how our clubs open and because of our draconian drinking laws and shit it makes it all licensing laws it makes it difficult to have people to play an extended set because essentially you're kind of you, I won't say you're cutting enough to spite your face but you are in a way because I reckon the whole premise of why these places book the same old names or the same range of names in these you know to kind of fill up a lineup is because the hope is each person playing it's going to bring a fan base and you're hoping that fan base comes and they spend a lot of money on drinks and stuff and they stay until the end um that's what you're hoping so you know each one kind of is going to bring like a hundred people you know under the from the strength of their name or their celebrity alone but if you do extended sets you're basically banking on just one person being able to fill out a room or two people so it's a bit difficult which is why a lot lot of places do it but i think now considering the how what the what's going on with the world of it kind of being on fire and considering people's hobbies habits and kind of wants have kind of changed you need to offer something different and i think the best way to do it is kind of to do something that doesn't maybe require any decision making skills you don't need to sit there and um and ah do i want to see x y and z it just you know you know straight away this place loki always has extended sets good back-to-backs and it's not that expensive so that you it will automatically make a decision okay cool i want to go out it's friday night then we'll go loki we'll pay 10 to go in or 15 quid and we're going to see some proper people playing between 10 to 4 that's a pretty good approach i think but I would, I would like to see the inside. Anyway, continue. So it says, any venue could Loki's opening in Brixton, South London next week, located on 32, 302 to 304 Barrington Road in what used to be the East Brixton Railway Station. Loki is a refreshing new 250 capacity space with touch up sound system a spokesperson told resident advisors the club will prioritize extended sets back-to-backs and not ridiculously expensive ticket prices loki which is run by the team behind the fox and firkin pub illusion no idea this is the thing as well that's really interesting as well in london it's very um it's very regional like there's loads of little scenes in different areas across london that you that don't really share anything in common and they kind of exist on their own dime. And I think South London is a good example of it. They've got an entire club scene over there, an entire different range of clubs that people go to and attend to. And they don't really overlap that much with places in the East, places in North, places in West. But I would like to go to, I would like us to get to a point where in the future we have one version of like a fold in each area of London, like Northwest um, and South, whatever, in terms of a place that opens until 6 a.m. That would be perfect. That would really put us on the next kind of level because at the moment, there's still only a couple of places that are open until that time. And some of them are a bit weird. Like I've got a place near me, um, which is like a pubby type place that's open until four or six. But again, it's not like a place where DJs play. It's just like a really, ra- really kind of run, I don't want to say run down, but a really kind of ghetto sort of, um, you know, pub that people go to after hours, but it's not the best vibe in there also. To be having an actual legitimate place where people can go and dance until those times would be absolutely amazing, I think. But hey, what do I know? It says here, um, 
Jag är från Lushem. Jag är öppen för en privat launch på november 2nd nästa vecka. Det säger jag att soundtrack by OK Williams och Nat Home. The club will open, then officially open to the public on November 4th with Bluetooth and Softy. On November the 10th, Loki will host an all vinyl party with Kyle Toole and Key and O'Keefe. The first in a run of weekly Thursday parties with one pound entry. Our DJs booked in November include Angel, Delight, um, Ben Hawk, Jay Wax, Jay Duncan, Mr. Ridley and Shivam Sharma. I like that all these people, I don't know their names, except for Angel Delight. And I like the fact that they sound like they could be all locals because that's something as well that kind of gets a bee under my bonnet. You open these places up and you just start booking fucking mash your plex and shit. It's like, what's the point? Um, but yeah, this is a five for it. Five to ten pound on RA. So I guess it's going to be the price in terms of going there. And it looks pretty awesome. Um, I want to, I definitely want to make sure and see if they're posting pics of it on the inside because I'm, I'm a fucking sucker for good inside pics of clubs and seeing the sound system and seeing what the bar would be and whatnot. Or it might just turn into one of those places where they kind of keep it under wraps until the day it actually launches so people can be surprised or what's on the inside of it. But let's see the Instagram stories and see if they've got the actual picture of the inside of it because I'd like to see what it looks like and what the vibe is in general. Um, but I'm assuming we're going to see a lot of exposed bricks, a lot of beams and stuff like that. I'd imagine the general kind of thing. Why isn't it opening up the story? Come on, open up. Let's see you, mate. Let's be having you. Let's be having you. Nope, it's not happening. Still not loading. Still not loading. Come on, come on, come on, son. Yeah, let's see. My phone's on here. Can I see the story? Okay, the, nothing really anyway. It's just the same fly repeated here on the bottom, so nothing really on there. But I'm also I'm really curious to see what it ends up looking like on the inside to get an idea on the vibe and shit. But definitely we'll check it out when it definitely ends up opening. I cannot wait to check it out. And like I said before, um, more details about it are obviously available. I'll put the link again in the show notes to check it out yourself if you want to. Um, Low-key opening soon. Low-key opening soon. Moving on from that news about elon musk buying twitter it's official now right so he's definitely bought it and um, it's all been wrapped up there's pictures of him going around um you know holding court in the cafeteria and basically eyeing up the people that he's gonna fire because the story is coming out that he's up he's basically potentially firing up to 70 percent of the staff or 75 percent of the staff which still you know it's, it's a crazy number but then when you find out eight thousand people work for twitter it kind of makes you think okay maybe they're a bit over you know they're, they're, they're probably hemorrhaging stuff and employees especially when you consider the platform you probably don't need that many people to run a site like twitter in general and he's definitely going to try to make them as lean as possible so that they can do the best work because essentially that's what he does in all these other companies he doesn't necessarily have a lot of fluff you know, i mean jobs like flipping social media manager and stuff will be absolutely you know swept under the rug quickly 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 but um this is a Post courtesy of the Wall Street Journal that basically kind of details um, Musk's first sort of statement regarding his acquisition of Twitter and it says Elon Musk's Twitter won't be a free-for-all hellscape addressing advertisers' concerns um, it says Elon Musk is excited um, so expected to complete a takeover of Twitter this week buying any last minute snags which is definitely I can confirm he has purchased it advertisers are concerned about the billionaire's plan to soften content moderation and what they are saying is potential conflicts of interest in auto advertising given that he's chief executive of Tesla Inc say most people people are familiar with the situation mr mr must said this spring that as an owner of twitter he would reinstate former president's trump account which the platform suspended definitely after linking trump's comments to jan six capital riots which is definitely going to be a fun time as soon as trump's you know account comes back in it's going to be absolutely lit on twitter again because i felt like we missed a lot of that kind of energy from him on that platform yes he might not be the best president we know that he definitely isn't presidential in the slightest but when it comes to providing entertainment on twitter he definitely was a good value for money so i should be fun um, it says yeah that would be a red line for some brands said kylie taylor a global head of partnerships at group m a leading ad buying agency that represents blue chip brands wow i didn't even know these jobs are still available but when i was looking during the pandemic these jobs of global head of partnerships or influencer manager things that those are the first to go because those are the nonsense jobs that usually a pretty decent or proficient or you know um, knowledgeable marketing manager could basically handle this pretty easily um, but when the times are booming having a global head of partnerships and then having an assistant head assistant partnership you know coordinator all those kind of nonsense roles there they're in abundance but you know credit to her in general moving on it says about a dozen of the group m's clients which own an array of well-known consumer brands have told the agency to pause all of their ads if twitter um 
Mr. Trump, sorry, if the ads on Twitter, Mr. Trump, sorry, reinstated, Ms. Taylor said others are in wait and see mode. Ms. Taylor said she expects to hear from many clients if Mr. Trump account returns. That does not mean that they won't be entertaining lots of emails and phone calls as soon as the transaction gets through. I anticipate it will be busy. Yeah, that's the thing. People are posturing and, you know, trying to act like the moral police and have principles and shit. But the truth of the matter is, if Trump does come back and he done, he does kind of you know, stir the pot that as he usually does and gets people to kind of pay attention to the app again or gets more eyes on it, then definitely if you're an advertiser, you'd be dumb not to put some of your ads on that platform when his account gets reinstated. Why wouldn't you do that? That would be stupid not to. Um, all that kind of free promo is priceless. Or all, all that, all those free eyes on there already and you're basically paying to put the stuff next to them is priceless, I think. In a message to Twitter, to advertising on Twitter on Thursday, Mr. Musk said that he was buying the company to have a common digital town square, which I like that phrase, actually, to be honest. I think that's pretty awesome. Um, uh, the digital town square, he says, and so Twitter cannot become a free-for-all hellscape where anything can be said with no consequences. Uh, Musk also said, in addition to following the laws, Twitter will be a warm and welcoming to all. He said Twitter aims to be a platform that strengthens our brand and grows a, uh, our enterprise. Twitter Chief Consumer Officer Sarah Perison, Sonic, tweeted that she had a discussion with Musk on Wednesday evening our continued commitment to the brand and safety advertisers um, remains unchanged looking forward to the future <laughs> hopefully you're still there my dear Mr. Trump said that he wouldn't rejoin Twitter even if allowed representative of Tesla Mr. Trump didn't respond to request a comment Mr. Musk is nearing the completion of acquisition of Twitter after a month-long legal battle in which he tried to back out of a 44 billion dollar deal he agreed in April the judge overseeing a legal fight said if the deal doesn't close by Friday she was schedule a november trial but essentially he overpaid you know but you know he got what he wanted in the end i'm curious to see what happens again um i've only been using twitter really um consistently over the last couple of years i feel like especially during lockdown i was paying more attention to it because i was essentially bored and had nothing to do and he to distract myself from just the constant hell of flipping covid updates and you know all that sort of stuff but it was also one of the best places to go for that kind of update because a lot of the public health officials a lot of virologists a lot of kind of scientists in general were just on there and using their platforms as a means to kind of you know inform people on what was going on offer alternative um points of view and stuff and it was nice to follow i'm not going to lie but then when you wanted to tap out and just get involved in some nonsense there was always accounts that you could follow that you could keep up to date with all the kind of nonsense that's happening around the world so it works i think it's maybe the best social media platform in my opinion especially now that twitter is basically pivoted into being a tiktok clone I feel like Twitter has a much better way of maybe understanding the things you like, especially when you start liking things and retweeting things. I feel like the recommendations you get on your main page or the for you page in terms of trending becomes a little bit more uh, personal, uh, pers yeah, personal to you, um, a little bit more kind of you know edited i don't know it just it just i think the algorithm just algorithms a lot better than any other platform i've used uh, it's way more enjoyable especially because i don't really get involved in arguments or debates and stuff i might go back and forth here and there but for the most part i'm not kind of wading into the mucky waters of um of cultural wars and stuff and all that kind of stuff and arguing with people about trans rights and all that nonsense i'm not getting involved in that in the slightest not my concern but when it comes to kind of bantering and having some fun especially with fellow fans especially with the football twitter side of things the fashion twitter side of things is pretty awesome so i'm curious to see what happens going forward and in general i think the idea that he has or the thing that he's pushing that twitter is a kind of public town square which basically means that the deletions and complete kind of bannings from that platform will be the last 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 resort because essentially if you don't have a voice on the public town square it essentially means you're not basically alive right you're not a fucking participating member of fucking society or humanity in general so everyone needs to have not it's not like an intrinsic right but it kind of is to have a twitter platform and you know from the time that trump got flipping banned and he was an acting president say what you like about him again i'm not the fan i'm not a fan i think he's a bozo but banning an, a sitting president is just really ridiculous and goes to show that maybe it was turning into a bit of an echo chamber it's difficult probably with these social media platforms to make them completely neutral but you have to try at least but you can't have them be a place where if you say certain things you get banned if you say certain things people don't ban you at all it needs to just be somewhere where the rules apply to all and the banning and the complete deletions or suspensions should be the last 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 straw um in terms of that and also maybe some transparency in terms of why people get banned and lock their accounts locked and shit like hey you can't post this type of stuff that's why we locked your account for 24 hours all that kind of thing should be really really handy going forward but let's see man 
let's see let's see um moving on from this we have some pretty embarrassing news for kanye to be honest probably one of the most embarrassing things he's probably had to go through and this is courtesy of tmz and it says kanye west um hey sketches got room for me shows up uninvited at the headquarters this is obviously off the back of what happened with adidas where they officially came out and severed all ties with kanye to the point where they said with the, with the immediate effect they were pulling all yeezy product from their stores then various people who worked in various stores were basically sharing information that they were getting phone calls from people in adidas hq that, to basically reiterate that point of view and that they wouldn't give him any understand they wouldn't give him any you know um, news or updates in terms of what they were going to do next like what was happening after that were they going to you know sell the product in other places was it going to go into you know um, outlets and stuff they just said no just get it all off of our shelves and our shop floors we don't want it anywhere sorry we don't get, get them off your shop floors we don't want that guy representing our brand in any slightest way whatsoever and the really harsh part about it is that Adidas for the most part his collaboration with Adidas with the Easy line was kind of made up I think the majority of his kind of billionaire status that he was hanging his hat on and that he was kind of reminding people about every single turn and now without it those projections don't look as good because you know you can only imagine if you're Forbes and you're trying to work out if someone's going to be a billionaire or not it's pretty easy when it comes to Kanye because all you got to do is look at past performance of Yeezy in terms of what they've done in a quarter and then look at what they've kind of been specking out for the future in terms of other models other silhouettes um, other areas they want to explore and it's only an upward trajectory right it, it, hopefully God you know um, God willing everything goes to plan in terms of people's health and stuff but it looks like an upward trajectory so it's pretty easy to draw the line between someone being a multi-millionaire and obviously going up to the multi-billionaire also but now that the Adidas deal is gone and he's essentially on his own having to fund all these things it kind of puts a huge dent on his finances because it's all well and good having 200 million 400 million in a bank but once you have to start manufacturing your own things to this level especially when it comes to footwear and i've heard from people who are way more versed in this than i am that footwear is the hardest hardest industry to get into um because of how expensive it is to set up in terms of your molds and all that kind of stuff and production and manufacturing it's just not an easy thing to do so the link up with adidas was basically a dream for him because you get access to their factories access to all their manufacturing type things actress access that you wouldn't normally have on your own and then essentially all you do is press a button and they make the thing for you you don't have to you know go through all the steps that you'd have to go through if you're a kind of independent person so him to show up at sketches is definitely it feels like a, a really desperate attempt to try to hold on to that billionaire status because I can't imagine any other scenario in my head or in the world that would make sense for Kanye to go to Sketches to try and ask them for a collab because it's a brand that you don't associate with Kanye in the slightest. Maybe this is a Ian Connor idea because he was kind of joking and sort of like, you know, wanting to... Um, get linked up with the sketches to do a collab or well, maybe he did end up doing it but for the longest time he was kind of trying to push the whole sketches vibe and it didn't obviously take off because they're awful shoes um, but it's just it's just sad to see the story that this has essentially happened that he went down invited to try and get a deal done and if you don't believe it sketches themselves put out an official press release with his name in the fucking title and it says sketches issue statement on Kanye West unauthorized visit um the the yeah, Sketches USA, the technology company, stated Kanye West also referred to as Ye, arrived unannounced and without invitation to one of Sketches' corporate offices in Los Angeles. Considering Ye was engaged in unauthorized filming, two Sketches executives exalted him and his party from the building after a brief conversation. Sketches is not considering and has no intention of working with West. We condemn the recent divisive remarks and do not tolerate anti Semitism in any other form or hate speech. The company would like to again stress that West showed up unannounced and uninvited to sketch his corporate offices that's them clearly telling you we want nothing to do with him because there's a bit here that kind of makes me think hmm maybe there's an opportunity for him to go back under the right circumstances in an official capacity when they said something along the lines of um uh the, when they said something along the lines of Ye was engaged in unauthorized filming right it makes me think <laughs> it makes me think that maybe if he didn't start filming that he would have a chance to speak to the right people there but they're clearly saying that the filming was just one part that kind of led to him being escorted to the premises but even if he didn't film and he came in with a full hat or whatever with a full suit and a hat in hand they still want to want him in the building I know 
which is absolutely crazy. But the funny thing is, if I'm not mistaken, two of the founders of Sketches are Jews, like, you know, legit Jewish people, whatever that means in my head. But he just probably picked the wrong place. And again, knowing Kanye, no research prior, no reading. Or maybe there was, maybe that was a whole point. Let me go and show people that I'm not anti-Semitic by going to do a collaboration with um, Sketches who are run by two prominent Jewish guys. I don't know, maybe that was the whole point. But this is the postcard to TMZ. It says Kanye is making a quick return. Um, it's a quick return. Is making a quick move to find a new home for his ET shoes. He and Sketches headquarters to talk with the company's honchos, but immediately got turned away. Sources of familiar with the ASA he tells us that he was at the company's main office on Wednesday morning in Manhattan Beach, California, but this was not scheduled meeting with the management. Sketches say he arrived unannounced and without invitation. Corporate offices in Los Angeles, considering he was engaged in authorized filming, two Sketches executives escorted him off. You can see two of the founders there, Michael and Robert. It says, now we don't know if, if um, Kanye did his research or not, but Sketches is owned and operated by a Jewish family. Robert Greenberg had founded it and his son, Michael, is currently the president. Considering his rampant anti-Semitism, you could say he bucked up the wrong tree. So maybe this was a ploy altogether to kind of, you know, get back in the good graces with the Jewish community by doing a collaboration with Sketches. I really do doubt it. I just think he tried to go for a brand that wasn't obvious and a brand that maybe he could kind of, you know, pull up by its bootstraps and sort of take it to a next level on his own single-handedly so he could basically stick it to Adidas for for basically letting him go and remind people of the Nike dude that he never got blah 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 same sort of conversation but I still think this is ridiculously embarrassing this is the picture of him um uh, this is a picture someone posted on TMZ. It looks like Kanye was in Manhattan, bread and bagel in Manhattan Beach on the Wednesday. We're told Kanye was with a friend who ordered some food for them and they sat at a table in the corner of the shop. So he's about out and about, but he's very quiet though. He's not really been saying as much as he was prior. Um, you can definitely tell that that flipping the Adidas still taking that away, the schools closing, all these other companies backing away is definitely going to be hurting him going forward. But I'm still a sucker a real big sucker for a redemption story i still want to see him kind of come back up again and claw himself up again it's really unlikely it's going to happen especially anytime soon with all these people kind of backing away because you don't become a billionaire on your own you need to do it in collaboration with others um you need to kind of work in tandem with them to kind of make that happen and if everybody's running away from you and thinks you're bad for business it's pretty difficult to be like a you know i don't say self-made but just on your own billionaire you definitely need people's help and assistance so let's see what happens going forward interested to see how it develops but i still think this is incredible be embarrassing if you're Kanye to get turned away by sketches you might also get turned away by fucking Umbro or something or Diodora it's like Jesus Christ man horrendous 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 moving on we have this I want to feature and talk about a little bit briefly this is uh, the hundreds winter 2022 collection and I just wanted to mention it only because you know I talk sometimes a lot about people and maybe brands and stuff that I maybe don't like especially if I've had a bad experience with people that actually run them but when it comes to stuff like the hundreds I think this is a really good story especially for kids who are coming up trying to make their own thing of an example of a brand who just stayed the course did their own thing keep their kept their head down didn't try and chase clout or chase cool and have been slowly but surely just churning along doing things and this is one of the brands i kind of first discovered when i first got into streetwear you know when i was into flipping diamond supply fresh drive fresh drive sorry um crooks and castles and all these type of things hundreds was in the same sort of kind of time area that i was kind of you know into those kind of brands and bobby hundreds was also the first person i met from the scene um in that era too legitimately because back then i had like a you know a semi-popular blog that people used to read called stop begging and I used to kind of feature some some stuff that I was into similar to what I'm doing in the podcast I'd feature some streetwear brands and maybe talk about stuff that I'd like to buy and whatever and I was pretty active on the Hypebeast forums also which Bobby used to post on um, back in the day and the first time I met Bobby Hundreds was actually an interesting time because I think it was around the time when I was having some issues with some people in the scene in London in general because everyone was kind of acting very big time-ish and I also probably didn't help things because I also wasn't somebody that would you know take the little bro thing 
well i didn't really acquiesce that well i didn't want to pay my dues or somebody annoyingly told me many 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 years ago i wasn't really into that sort of vibe because i was kind of you know looking at people like hiroshi fujiwara and james jebbia as my sort of kind of icons and people that i was kind of trying to follow in their footsteps and i don't think they ever paid their vibes they just went out and did cool shit and people basically followed them um so this idea that you had to pay your vibes or sorry uh, pay your dues and sort of like you know lick the asses of people who just threw parties or who were just around and stuff was just really annoying so I really had an issue with some of that stuff going on again some of it was my own fault some of it was other people's fault maybe 50-50 maybe it was more of my fault who knows so to kind of find or to kind of you know meet somebody like a Bobby Hundreds in real life and you know walk around the shops with him and see how people treated him and see how differently people treated me when they saw me with him was a real big eye opener and you know for me in general I always say when it comes to those people especially prominent people it's not hard to have a fan for life like i might not be a fan of the clothing like i haven't worn the hundreds in many years the last time i purchased the hundreds must have been maybe more than 10 years ago i have to definitely say that but i'm always going to be a fan of bobby and ben hundreds because of how well they treated me and how well they came across they were really nice kind just cool guys and i never and it kind of reaffirmed to me that the idea that I had about, you know, looking up to the actual people who were operating and shipping stuff as opposed to the people who were just, you know, in it to be the marketing assistant and whatnot and do the social media was definitely a better way to go. And it also solidified in my brain that for some reason, I don't know why it is, the the person who actually runs the shop or runs the show is usually way more cool and way more chill than the person who works at the store on the weekend or the person who knows a person who knows a person who knows that person it's always like that i'm not sure what the case is because all the issues i had with people in london were definitely from people who were kind of i won't say hangers on but they were the ones who were just basically supporting the person doing the genius work they weren't the actual operators of it very rarely did i meet operators who were wankers the only time i did was maybe the palace guy and stuff but that was a long time ago he maybe had an attitude because you know of where he come i don't know whatever but those people that that's the only person who i met who was legitimately someone that i definitely wasn't a fan of as a person but maybe they've changed but everyone else who was a cunt was basically people who were working on the periphery or on the outside so to meet someone like bobby hundreds at a time who was i think really really well known back then probably even more so now especially after the band blew up and the books and the interviews and documentaries were good stuff it was really a big eye opener and kind of reaffirmed to me okay cool this is who i need to kind of look at as a kind of as a as brendan Schub would say as a north star <laughs> but yeah it's just cool to see them still doing it that's why i wanted to bring it up like winter 22 collection they're still out there pushing products and i think at the time when they were coming up there's a lot of kind of comparison to supreme and maybe supreme was way more refined and a lot more you know and a lot more experience and had a lot more know-how and just had a lot more maybe street cred and whatnot and people kind of looked at it differently when it came to hundreds maybe hundreds looked a little bit slapstick a little bit cringe especially that association with the filipino community for some reason really i think like hurt their cool points uh, and you know for whatever reason who knows but i just like the fact that they just continue doing what they're doing and eventually the world i won't say the world caught up but the world sort of adjusted and sort of realize hey you they can coexist you can have a supreme and the hundreds but it doesn't mean because hundreds the supreme exist the hundreds don't need to exist because it's not as good they can both exist and kind of um you know appeal to whatever audience they want to appeal to and i think now looking at it it just looks way more refined and well more put together than it ever did in the past when i used to wear it and again that makes sense because they were just maybe starting they were figuring it out on the go but look wise you know if you if someone told you this was the hundreds you would never know it was you know especially just if you want if you didn't see the title or anything you just kind of saw the clothing you'd think that just looked like any other cool well put together brand right they've got this uh flannel over shirt thing it looks pretty thick with a hood on it a nice long sleeve t-shirt some combat pants and okay he's wearing air force ones just a really clean and easy put together look again you wouldn't think it was overtly a hundreds type of thing i do like this long sleeve here with this wave logo on the side oh it's a chain link that's pretty nice that graphic with the h is fucking banging I'm assuming that's a done from scratch as well. That looks really, really good. So yeah, nice look book. Great clothing as per usual. Nice selection of teeth. That jersey is banging. Oof. I like that. Wow. There's a jersey here with um in black and white, written with O3. I think that maybe is it the year they launched? Maybe they made they launched with the hundreds on the back here written. And I also like that this is a tiny detail, but I've always liked the fact that there's no space between the and the hundreds. That it's all kind of one word, but you read it how you're meant to read it, right? The hundreds. I think that's always pretty cool. The S here looks like it's floating a bit. Maybe I'm kind of seeing things, but I like that. I really do like that. The white mesh, it looks like. Is it white mesh or 
Maybe it's not white. Maybe it's just, maybe it's not actually a mesh. It's just a t-shirt. It looks like, but it looks pretty sick. I'm not going to lie. And the thing I was mentioning too, I was thinking about it, is that you know what's interesting about the hundreds. I think way more people out there are, are probably on the way or trajectory to end up like a hundreds than they are supreme. I think supreme is a is the kind of what do you call it? Supreme is a unicorn, right? They're the one-off one, but a lot of people think they can emulate that or copy their success, but you're probably not going to. You're probably going to end up being more similar to a hundreds, and even a hundreds isn't something easy to emulate because they've survived and they've kind of thrived in this industry for many, many years. Loads of politics behind the scenes and they've always managed to kind of come out the, on the other side, so it clearly shows that they know what they're doing as business operators, they know what they're doing as professionals, as a brand, as humans and stuff, but it just kind of works out altogether. Um, I really do like it and maybe it's just the perfect marriage because it's always been Bobby and Ben hundreds you know on paper one guy handling the creative and one guy handling all the money stuff it just makes it easy to just keep churning it out and just keep turning up and putting out product because one person handles the creative side and one person handles the money side there's no kind of um, you know blurring of the lines or messiness involved um, but yeah I like I like all of it that jersey is really one of my favourite pieces in there nice chair as well it comes in red and red and black, which kind of looks a bit similar to the Angolan flag. Actually, this this colorway looks a little bit similar to the Angolan flag. Very, very, very. It's, gi it's given Angola, to be honest, but I'm guessing they want no. A nice little what was that? We call that zip up hoodie um, with the hundreds written on the back of it. Also, maybe this is stuff I'm not really a fan of. This kind of stuff plus on the front of this. I think it's a little bit corny. It reminds me of your, your it reminds me of a uh, one six and Park or something. That's why it looks like one six and Park outfit. So I'm not really too down with that. But I like this. Whatever those is that Digi camo is that tie dye. They've got these tie dye combats that look like they've been made in sweat material. This lovely fleece type thing is pretty cool as well. But maybe the model actually makes it cool because she comes across cool herself. Um, they've got a back of this quilted. I guess it's the same jacket she's wearing, right? The back of this one, the back of this weird. Oh no, it's not the back. Maybe it's maybe it's inside out. Maybe maybe that's what I'm I'm looking at. Inside out, inside is a fleece, and then maybe the outside has got this kind of uh, what do you call it? Um, this yellow logo. Is that a Chinese dragon or Chinese? I don't know what that what that kind of style is, but you know what I mean. At the back of it, and then you got another picture here with the green jacket, which I'm not a fan. Like I said, it's giving one of six and Park. It's giving Rusky and whatever that her girl's name in the other guy who's presenting with her on there. Um, but yeah. Um, big up the hundreds for being consistent. Big up the hundreds for stepping up, for showing up all the time and shipping, and just being absolute gents of a human. Because you know it doesn't take much to have a fa to have a fan for life, and they've got a fan for life in me just because of the strength of that one brief interaction we had back in the day when I used to fucking intern for twelve bar. So big up the hundreds. Next we have this which is pretty cool. I think in terms of a uh, silhouette and shape, I'm not too familiar with the brand Keen but they've teamed together with engineered garments to make this shoe called the Jasper 2 EG Mock. And it kind of reminds me uh, of the Avery Dirch, or whatever that name is of the Nike that they put out on HG, that kind of shape. But I just like the fact that it's an alternative looking type of shape. It's not something that is inspired by like a fucking, you know, a New Balance or a Nike runner or something. It's kind of a, a fresh flip on that kind of regard. Even though, you know, I said it looks like the fucking Avery Dirty, but I still think in terms of a silhouette it's still a bit you know unique enough to kind of cause people to think are oh, those you know whatever but then when they get close they realize straight away now nah, these are a little bit different and it's got like a rubberized kind of sole here on the front so it took um toe on the front with the rubberized bits so I'm assuming that's to help you you know go trekking or to like you know stub your toe into a wall so you can kind of climb it without a harness or just stand really cool in this kind of photo shoot and make it look like you're going outside when you just on the pavement somewhere in this clean area but the browns look really really nice not going to lie um i'm a big fan of these um engineered garments as well collaboration makes a lot of sense with these as well i'm not going to lie i like everything about them in the slightest so definitely we'll maybe keep an eye out for them to see what they end up looking like in real life but the article for hypebeast says as follows um engineered garments and keen have just presented their third collaboration the duo previously linked up for their unseat collaboration 2020 before they reconnected in 2021 for the open air shoe now the close collaborations have teamed up once again to present a revitalized version of the jasper 2 sneaker aptly dubbed the jasper 2 eg mock for the jasper 2 eg mock the shoe has been upgraded with a new upper design and it's completely waterproof and uh oh wow it's completely waterproof i didn't know that it doesn't actually look it does it 
not gonna lie, it doesn't look it, but these are meant to be completely waterproof. Okay, cool. I, I, I really do like them though, especially this kind of plain, non patterned kind of upper. I'm a big fan of. They actually look good in boots too, if they made a boot version like a mid or a high. They look pretty sick, I'd reckon. Continues, and if you choose to wear it with laces, the collaboration is also offering an additional set to allow you to customize your, from your original pair. You can get a closer look at them above, and it's available to buy now on Keen and the official Engineer Garment store. Let's see how much it is available on Keen. Um, I think, what, 300 quid? That's my guess. Maybe 250. Let's see how much they sell these for. This collaboration, what does it go for? What does it go for? Oh, we have, don't have it because I guess I'm logged into the UK version, so it's not going to show me. That's annoying, isn't it? I'd love to see what they actually sell for. Oh, yeah, can't see it on here, unfortunately. It looks like, let's see if they got it on another side. What's the other side they had there? They had Keen side and they had an engineered garment side. Let's see if they got them on the actual legit engineered garment side. That'll be interesting to see how much they're actually going for. Uh, let's move it on. Go back here. It's loading. Okay, cool. Let's see here. Oh, okay, so you can't, oh, so you can't even purchase them anyway, it looks like. That's a bit annoying, isn't it? There's no option to actually buy them anywhere. Let's see. Beams and Barracuda, Glover Raw. Um, but yeah, no actual place to actually purchase them themselves. But yeah, that engineer garments and palace collaboration looks really cool. But again, you know, I can never be seen dead wearing palace, so that's never gonna happen. But in general, I like the shoe, I like what it looks like. Um, it's already available, but I can't find it anywhere. So maybe it's already sold out, which maybe explains why people, well, I'm, me, myself, I like it, especially being an ACG head. I can see other guys who maybe matured out of wearing ACG stepping up and buying a pair of flipping low top engineered waterproof boots. You know what I mean, with normal cotton socks on, cracking psychotic stuff. But hey, what can you do? What can you do? Next on the list, what do we have here? What do we have here? Oh yeah, we have this, right? We have uh, J Crew and Beams. I think I spoke about beforehand that I wasn't necessarily the biggest fan of what I saw from J Crew under the stewardship of Noah Babazian, who is the creative director of um, Noah and is also the former designer rep Supreme. I just feel like he's maybe been spread a bit too thin and the J Crew stuff just looks a bit derivative and it looks a bit repetitive and that's not really interesting in the slightest. But this freeway collaboration, it feels like between Noah or between Brendan, J Crew and Beams Plus is a bit more refreshing. Maybe it's a model, maybe it's the pictures that kind of sell it, but it just looks really, really cool. You start off with this picture, which is essentially like a, what would you call it? Like a fishtail parka, which I have a similar version without the hood in an olive green with like a quilted inner jacket, which is really nice. So that kind of is a staple you'd get in Beams, um, which I'm remember, if I'm not remembering correctly, Beams was always like an upscale version of like Uniqlo. So you could go there for like really cool basics, essentially maybe like a Japanese version of J Crew actually, more so than Uniqlo was. Um, and it was a little bit, had a bit more style to it, maybe had a bit more pizzazz to it. The cuts were maybe a little better than the standard Uniqlo things. And then over time, it just kind of slowly but surely died away. And this was after all the big Japanese people to collaborate with them. Like I think Double Test might have did something, Hiroshi and Fragment might have did something with Beams. It felt like every other one under sun was chasing them and all of a sudden they kind of dropped out of favor but it's cool to see them come back under the j crew umbrella i think that probably works a bit better than doing it under noah but it looks cool loads of cool jackets in this entire collection that i had obviously buy in a heartbeat and over shirts and stuff but i've got so many of these things it's going to be a bit hard to end up wearing any of it but they do look pretty sick i'm not going to lie they really do look sick even this guy here in a pinstripe shirt with different color look with different color sleeves and shit looks really nice and yeah, I'm a big fan of it. I'm not going to lie. I'm a big, big, big fan of it. Maybe I'm not a big fan of the guys, you know, trendy, flipping, hipster, tash, but, you know, we have to do what to do to get attention. But I do like the collection overall. I do like the pictures. Um, I like the fact that they've kind of additionally advertised it to really young kids because, you know, not a lot of people who are Gen Z would be wanting to wear an unbranded piece of engineered garment clothing, right? If it does have the logo, what's the point? It's like that saying, you know, if a tree falls and no one hears it, it's a tree fall. It's that kind of idea. 
Um, but let's go on the article itself says J.Crew unveils new collaboration with Beamed Plus despite being a brand more geared towards finance and bros those were with preppy fashion sensibility J.Crew has often dabbled with various collaboration projects across the years for this collaboration the Japanese sportswear saw a streetwear label drew inspiration from American style implemented prep and uniform sleeves um, into the range oh yeah that's true so I think from tomorrow onwards all money that's been spent um, by flipping your you know us and stuff will be having that on it which is pretty crazy standing on the outwear category is core jacket so it's a chore jacket that comes in styled with a cordray fabric and patchwork details and military inspired hues as well as a hooded uh milk coat that comes in a warm brown and reversible liner blouson which is what i got from flipping beams they love a reversible blouson they absolutely love it but the pictures are really good they really sell the product i'm going to lie way more than the first collaboration between J. Crew and Noah I feel like he's maybe a little bit more comfortable in what he wants to do and obviously having Jason Dill maybe work work alongside him him being like a fairly older dude now would make a lot of sense too to inform what kind of goes on in the future but so far so good from them I do like it way better than the first collection I ever saw on the J. Crew. but now I think it's heading in the right direction I'm heading into the right direction what else we have here ba 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 I think that might be it for now, you know. Yeah, I think that might be it, unfortunately. It's not much else news to kind of cover. Oh, yeah, let's cover this. So this is actually the last bit to cover is this courtesy of Stray Rats. So Stray Rats are putting out a New Balance MT580, which to me kind of brings back a lot of good memories of kind of being on Crooked Tongues Forum, being on FUK Forum, being on Fifth Dimension Forum and hanging out and doing that business. And the core kind of um, part about this story is also that I'm familiar with flipping, what's his name? with um, Iron Coops from the forum days you know that's when I kind of knew him I don't really speak to him now I don't really know him too tough now at the moment to call a friend or anything but we were definitely friendly I would say back in the day when we used to be posting pictures of our fits on forums like fuk.co.uk fifth dimension you know fuck all those wankers on there they were absolute pricks but still we used to use that page we'd use um, what else would you use sometimes we use super future as well so it's pretty cool that he went back into the archive and pulled the model that isn't the most popular model now amongst any be kind of fanboys who are maybe the most tasteless fanboys out there they don't really have any taste they just buy whatever comes out and is limited john puts out another green gray cream flipping new balance and they kind of all lap it up because it's got jam written on the back of the hill tab but no real interesting color so at least when it comes to um stray rats new balance collaborations they've got a few here on the bed they're all really cool colorways they're all trying to push the envelope trying to challenge the consumer quote unquote as they say in fashion a lot which is really cringe but they just look really cool and interesting that's just basically it and i like the pictures harken back to that era back in the day where sneakerheads would stand next to their boxes of shoes that they actually own not resale pages i think that's really weird i think nowadays like there's not really a lot of kind of culture of people actually buying cool shoes that they like and trying to make them pop it's just a lot of meet mr me twos a lot of jordan ones buying a lot of random easy buying a lot of flipping Sal salili Bembry flipping crocs buying like no one's really being innovative or no one's kind of pushing the envelope a little bit they're all just doing the same thing again and again and again and um i hate it but these pictures are fucking awesome i'm not going to lie the laces in these shoes are really thick and awesome in it they look like they're wax okay they're not they're just a bit thicker um laces uh, they look like they will drop awesome and they look at it a little bit short as well they're not extra long so they don't you don't have to kind of snip them or anything which is always an annoying thing to do because when you snip them you basically kill the laces but i like that i like that look overall they've got another picture here that kind of harkens back to that era of somebody placing all their shoes on stairs and stuff that was something you saw you saw where maybe someone had a collection of air max ones um from all the, it, the years they come out from 87 onwards every iteration and they have them all lined up so you can see the difference in the shape the bubble the form everything is pretty cool so that's really nice to see and of course the obligatory picture of all the shoes kind of covering you on the couch and stuff and you flossing and that iconic picture of that sneakerhead back in the day who put his shoes on ice inside the fridge as well to kind of help them and also be a bit of a troll online the pictures in the mirror all these things remind me of stuff from back in the day when i used to be on forums and it's absolutely cool i'm not going to say really cool but the funny interesting thing is that this stuff is still sitting on the website i'm not sure if it's because of stray rats not being the most super popular brand in the world and maybe you know iron coop's doing his business a certain kind of way but i'm just shocked 
that these shoes are absolutely sitting on here and I've checked already before but let me go back to the main page and see if I'm mistaken and things have maybe changed but they're sitting and there's a full size run but for someone like myself that actually wants a pair to wear I'm not that bothered um, there's no sold out tag next to them and they're only for some reason which is wild they're only 150 I don't know if that's a price that they're allow you're allowed to set as a brand where you do a collaboration or if this is something that like New Balance do internally because why can this be 150 but the jound ones are always like 200 plus you know that doesn't make any sense like what's the what's the problem there is it because that model that he's making is harder to manufacture this maybe is easy I'm not really too sure but considering the complex colors and all that malarkey and different materials you'd think this would be a lot harder to do than another New Balance 998 or whatever it is right or 990 991 but for whatever reason it is just way it is but i've always liked these um they, again they kind of remind me of these uh mad hectic stussy new bands mt 580s i had back in the day that i still to this day regret selling i'm pretty sure i had this pair here in pink with the pink suede and the metal so the pink suede and a sort of like mesh metal sort of thing on the toe box that looks pretty cool um and again i really regret selling these they're one of my favorite pairs of shoes but for some reason i guess i kind of try to downside my collection and sell them another thing to note again this has definitely been set up by an actual sneakerhead look at the laces i always mention how i like laces to be a certain way where the the lace that goes out on this this side of the right hand side is always over and the ones that go out that side are always come you know over on the left hand side and of course I've always sneak ahead kind of did it all the way to the top so that's pretty cool to see the only thing I don't like is this last lace it doesn't, it doesn't go underneath it should go over all the time to keep the tongue there and never go through that tongue eyelid thing either that's pretty lame but overall um, big fan of those flipping um, MT 580s and some nice press shots here as well or PR shots that look similar to back in the day when people used to post pictures of their shoes and the weird angles and shit the only thing they're missing is maybe a pinroll picture but i guess because no one wears new balance for mt 580s on with fucking pinrolls it probably doesn't make that much sense but um i do like them i can't wait to purchase a pair myself and wear them into the absolute ground and i'm just shocked and appalled that they're still sitting there considering all the other basic bitch fucking new balances that exist out there but hey i guess it is what it is um if you want to purchase it you can as you can see the banner free world without shipping and um free us shipping over 100 dollars, which is sick but yeah that is jackson's thing show episode number six one what what I say? I said, I think I said 614, didn't I? Or 615, one of them. But regardless, thank you so much for tuning in. If you listen to the, you know, audio app, you'll hear my tune today. If you're watching this via YouTube, you won't. It'll just go to black. But thank you anyway for listening. And please make sure you smash that like for me. If you haven't already, leave me a comment if you want to come back for some more. But until then, take care, my friends. Peace. <laughs>